Hello and welcome to the Cultural Stew Moments of Influence. My name is Ron Harkins Jr. and I am happy and excited to have my first or uh, my next guest here, Danny Hoskins. Hey. Danny is the artistic director of Blackfriars Theater. Danny, tell me a little about yourself. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm uh, originally from Rochester. Uh, I, um, I've been um, back here 11 years now. I uh, was away for about 11 years in New York City and Atlanta and in grad school and then came back about 11 years ago and started getting into the art community here, the theater community here. And uh, over the past couple of years, just been really lucky to, to get the, the work that I've gotten. And uh, and now I wound up, uh, it's my third year at Blackfriars Theater, and I also teach at Brockport and U of R and NAS um, as an adjunct professor as well. And you're a man who is not afraid to get your hands dirty on either side of the stage. Or, um, <laughs> I remember I first met you probably, I think it was Little Women. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was my first um, show at Blackfriars. And kind of saw you come in and out with a couple shows. And then, you know, we were in the midst of moving from the old Lawn Street to the new one. And uh, just, you know, you got your hands in there dirty and, you know, helping build the new theater out. And uh, we worked on a couple projects together and um, uh, we still have a maintained relationship over Blackfriars. Um, so I've gotten to know Danny a little bit well. Um, and he is a person who loves to tell stories. Um, <laughs> that is probably, as we were discussing, going back and forth as to what we were going to talk about today, um, that was the one thing that stuck out to me is he is a guy who just loves being around telling stories, whether he's doing it in front of a camera, or he's doing it on stage, or he's directing it or producing it. Um, that is what he does. Uh, Danny, what are we going to talk about today? <laughs> what, what is the book that you... So I, I think that the thing that got me, there's a, there's a lot that got me started. It's hard to pinpoint one thing, but the thing, the one thing that got me started realizing the power of what stories was, was in seventh grade. Um, my grandfather, I think he gave it to me to just, so he didn't have to like watch me. Um, uh, he gave me a copy of Stephen King's It. And uh, it's a 1300 page book. It's this huge book. And I think he just kind of did it. <clears throat> looking back on it, I think he did it just kind of as a, here, yeah, yeah, here, kid, take, take this. <laughs> um, and uh, and they they lived they lived in Florida, so I would go down and spend time with them uh, in Florida in the summers and stuff, and uh, and so I think he just kind of gave it to me as a way to keep me busy, and uh, and I and I and I read it and and I'd never read anything like that before, and it was in seventh grade, so I I didn't read a lot of stuff, um, and I don't don't know what it was about it that made me connect to it right away as opposed to you know all the books you get in school and you're supposed to read this you're supposed to read that or your parents you know read this book or read that book and I have no no interest in it and uh and I and I read it and I read all you know 1200 1300 pages of it and I I loved it and I fell in love with it and and it moved me and it it scared me it was in 7th grade it terrified me um and uh and I think it also connected to uh my buddy my best friend and I we lived uh, grew up next door to each other um Loved like cheesy horror movies, like B, B, B horror movies in the eighties, loved watching those things. And, uh, and so it, it kind of connected to that, but it, what it did was it unlocked, I think it unlocked like this world of imagination in my own head. Cause watching movies is one thing you're watching and it's doing it for you. But when you're reading a book, you're, you know, you're, you're creating that world yourself. Um, so I think that unlocked for me this whole other, uh, realm of what you could do of what you how you could create how you could tell stories how you could affect people how you could move people how you could create um uh that engagement with someone um and uh, so that's i think that's 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 if i pinpoint one thing like that's that's the one the one uh the one thing that i think really got me excited about storytelling uh so now it is an interesting book Mm -hmm. um i have not read the book i've seen the movie the, I think I remember seeing the older film. I, but I definitely I just watched the the latest film last night. Actually, oh, did you? Yeah. So, <laughs> What'd you um, think? That was interesting. I'm actually interested in in your take because, yeah. um, as I, I as I've talked about on our show, is I kind of tend to read the books after I see the film uh-huh. because my imagination just runs wild, and then I'm always disappointed if I go and see a film and it's yeah. just like. Watch the film first, then go back and read it. You had the other opposite effect with this one. You've seen 
you've read the book. That was your your starting point. What what did you feel the differences are? You saw the did you see the original one with Tim Curry? Yeah, I saw the original with Tim Curry. I mean, it's it's a huge it's a huge story. It it, it spans essentially two two generations. It's them as kids, and then it's them as adults. So this new film is just the the first part, just the um, them as kids, and then them as adults is uh, the kind of the second half of the book. Um, so I, I remember the one with Tim Curry, and I remember being as a kid. It, it just it. It, it had it had all the points. It hit all the points. Um, it just wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't scary. It wasn't terrifying. I mean, it, the book is terrifying. Um, and I thought what they did well in this new film. And I actually just rewatched it like a week ago. Um, and uh, and and I think what they did really well in this film is they is, is they the 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 scare factor, the fear factor comes from the kids. And I think the the each kid each kid has its own has his own or her own um relationship to it um and it manifests itself in its own way re- in relation to the kid and i think one of the things they did really well was was uh, specify that terror for each of those kids i mean the, if, if that happened to me as a kid i would be crapping my pants oh, absolutely. <laughs> i mean terrified I, I wouldn't go to sleep for weeks um and i think that's one of the successes of this of the newest film is that they really um they really gathered, or they really, got, they they really um, uh, nailed the the fear of what it instilled in those kids, those kids, the terrifying those kids, um, and I, I didn't get that from the first film. As uh, much. Now they also changed the the time period, so they put in the newest film they put the kids in the eighties, whereas the first one yeah. in the book they're in the fifties. I think they're yeah. So well, yeah. it now take this book that came out in eighty six, I yeah. think, and. You're reading it at how old? Seven? Seventh grade. So it was 13? 13. 12, 12, 13. Same ages as the characters in the book. Yeah. So you have this instant connection with, oh, these characters I can relate to. They're my age. You know, yeah. it's also the most impressionable age. Um, it, they, there was a study that I read last week of like how most people's music tastes are set between 13 and 16. Um, really? It, it kind of defines the way that they listen to music for the rest of their life. And it's just a very impressionable age. And it's just where we're coming into our own. And I remember like for me with music, I remember like I was all, all hitched on to whatever my parents were listening to. And then somewhere around like 13 years old, it was just like, boom, I was listening to other stuff. And it was like I couldn't stand what they were listening <laughs> to. But here we have it. They've changed the – the in the new movie they change it to being the 80s so mm. here we are we're both you know we grew up in the 80s so we we feel that little bit of a connection and you know they did this with the the netflix with stranger things set yeah. in the 80s make that connection yeah and now they're going to take the next one the next chapter 27 years later and it just happened to happen in 1989 so 27 years later here we are in our day and age yeah um so we're going to be having the these kids come back it's cool yeah. Um, so this affects you in the way that you start telling stories. What is the, the first things that you start doing after this starts, like, getting that going in you? Well, I think I, it, was, it, it was kind of a, uh, an amalgam of a lot of things happening at that time. I think um, in, you know, in, in, <clears throat> in fifth and sixth grade and into seventh, once we got into to junior high and then into high school um, – we got into a lot of a lot of superhero stuff, a lot of comic books. So it went from it, it went from reading, um, right, and I started to jump into a lot of Stephen King stuff. I jumped into like James Herbert stuff, like other other horror Dean Koontz, other horror authors as well. Um, and uh, uh, and then and then we started reading a lot more comic books and collecting more comic books. And then we started to draw. Um, and we had this thing called this is if it was an inspiration like this would be another inspiration thing. With this, we had this thing called the Mighty Men and Monster Maker. It was um, these plates. It had leg plates, chest plates with arms, and head plates. And it had, I think, a dozen. Like, they were double-sided. And you could interchange the legs, the arms, and the head. And you would um, use a crayon and, like, rub it over the paper. And it would, it would whatever pose it was in, it would draw. And then you could color it, right? Um, or you could, like, just rub some of it and you could draw your own off of it. Uh, like, just rub the, 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 the torso and then you could draw, like, octopus legs off of it. Um, and we started... Well, we started using that. Um, <laughs> we started using that to create like this hundreds of characters, um, comic book characters, 
and and created our own like our own world and we had um the paper boxes you know the the the, mm-hmm. the, the case of papers that 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 uh paper comes in now we had two or three of those things just f- and they were half a sheet paper um just filled hundreds and hundreds probably thousands of these different people that we would just constantly just draw color draw color and we name them and we give them like a little backstory and we throw them in the box and we do another one and we spend afternoons um and and from so from there it it started into uh, just really doing our own thing, t- t- telling stories our own way, and, and, and manifested itself into at the beginning into the comic books and superheroes. We would do our own comic books. We would do um, like our homemade films, VHS camera, and mm-hmm. do little homemade films and stuff. Um, and uh, and then from there, and then from there, it just it just naturally went into theater because as, as far as Anything to do extracurricular with large groups, that was what we had as kids. Was You know, you, had, you did sports or you had theater. Um, uh, and for, <laughs> more theater than we had than have now in schools. Um, but we had, you know, we had classes. Um, we had after-school workshops. We had after-school um, we had sh- shows, you know, do the shows at, the, at school. Um, so then it just, it just naturally rolled into that. And then my best friend was in it as well. So it was a kind of natural progression that we went from um, – just doing it with our at our you know at home with ourselves or with our friends to then doing it in the schools and then like eighth grade ninth grade <clears throat> ninth grade it really settled in for me and I just started doing theater in ninth grade and then and then it was there from there on out yeah end of story yeah <laughs> <laughs> and then it went and then, you know went from there but yeah so you graduate from school go to college Nazareth no no I went to uh, Elmira College. Elmira. Yeah, yeah, Nazareth or something. Oh, sorry about that. No, no, it's, um, it's the same thing as private, small private school. And you pursued theater there. I did. I, I didn't go in as a another fun little story. I didn't go in as a theater major. I went in as a criminal justice major. So my first year, I was a criminal justice major, and I wanted to be um, I wanted, superhero lawyer. <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted to be like in the FBI. I wanted to be in you know, a secret service. I wanted to do something cool. Um, and uh, but then I found out at the end of my first year. Um, if you wanted to get to those uh, to to those uh, departments or those um, those areas, you had to go through um, either the military or you had to go through state police as kind of a prerequisite. Uh, and I didn't want to do either of those things, so I was like, "All right, now forget it. <laughs> that, 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 that seals it for me. I didn't want to do that, either of those things." Um, so then I changed to a, a math major. I was I was really good at math, so yeah, I was like, hey, "My parents are like you got to have some kind of major. You got to have some folk book." So my sophomore year, I came in as a math major. Um, and I was going to be a math teacher. I was like, I'll just do that. And I still did theater. Um, but I was like, that's what, that's what I'll focus on. And then I was sitting in my first math class and, uh, you know, we're in a, in a half circle and the teacher's going around the circle going, uh, so, so why do you want to be a math teacher? Why do you, and everyone's talking and, and, uh, I'm listening to everybody. I'm going, well, that sounds good. I'll say that. And I was at the end of that half circle. Well, that sounds good. And someone else said, like, oh, that's smart. That's, that's good. I'll say that too. And someone else said something. I'm like, I kind of feel like that. Maybe I'll put that in there. Okay. And then as, as, I'm, as I'm hearing myself say this, I'm like, I don't have an answer to that question. I'm trying to take everybody else's answers. Why the hell am I in this class? Why the hell is this my major? So I literally got my stuff, got up and just walked out of the class <laughs> before it got to me. I was like, oh, this is, no, I'm done. And I went right there to the, to the registrar's office. And uh, uh, unbeknownst to my parents, I changed my major one more time to theater. And then uh, I called them a couple days later. I was like, "So, uh, <laughs> surprise!" So you guys know, <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, it, it was. It just was. That's what I wanted to do. This is what I wanted to do. And, and I've been, I've been lucky. I've been, I've been really grateful and for the opportunity I've had. I've been really lucky to be able to do what I, I love, for the most of my life. So you graduate. You've pursued theater. How do you? How do you end up with? this career that you now have, that you are literally the force behind putting up shows for the public. (laughs) I keep jumping. I keep like saying one thing and then going, and that's how it happens. (laughs) Ron gets good. He's pulling me back. He's pulling me back. Go back. Um, So uh, from there I went, uh, I had two mentors at Elmira College that came in my sophomore year. Thankfully the year that I changed my major, they came in um, uh, director and the theater director and um, his wife and his wife, was a Broadway actress, and he had worked um, regionally as a, as a regional director um, in, in a lot of big theaters down in the South. And they came in that year, and 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 thankfully to me, they they kind of helped shape me uh, and, and train me for for where where I was headed. And uh, at the end of 
at the end of my uh, undergrad, uh, we decided to go to New York, and we were like, we're going to give it a shot, just like every kid. And uh, and they were both they were both really supportive. They're like, that's awesome. That's what you got to do. But they knew that I needed more training. They said, you know, one of the things you should think about is really going back to grad school and getting getting a little more training. Um, and uh, and and if that's you know if that's where you, when you want to do it, then we'll help you. You know, we'll help we'll, get, we'll help you support you in what you need to do. And uh, and so I went to New York, and I was there for a little over three years, and then decided that uh, I started to have a real love hate relationship with with New York. And and I was getting I was getting um, the callbacks, and I was making it to the ends of these processes, and I was getting down to like the last two or three people. I was one of the last two or three people, but I was never I was never getting the role. And uh, and I thought at that point I was like you know what maybe I do need a little more to get the training I'm, I'm getting there but I don't I'm not I'm not securing things and I'd gotten an agent, um, and uh, I I had uh, been been getting 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 work but nothing that was of a nature that was going to kind of move me to the next level, and uh, and so I thought I'll just I'll just go back to grad school so actually and they actually helped me find um, uh, University of South Carolina which is where I went to for grad school um, after that. And so I went down to, down to South Carolina and and did my graduate work in acting there, um, and uh, and it was a fantastic program. Um, one of my uh, one of my grad school buddies uh, is uh, is doing a lot of TV now, and he was just he was in the in the Inhumans. He had, in, it was in one of the oh. Inhumans episodes. <laughs> uh, he was one of the he was one of the. Um, Policeman that that threw the the that captured uh, a black bolt and like threw him into the, um, uh, in the, like the third episode, second episode, third episode. But he had a pretty he had a pretty big role in it. Um, but anyway, I, I digress. Uh, but uh, so I went so I went to grad school there, and then I went to Atlanta and worked in Atlanta for about three years. And I worked at the Alliance Theater, which is a Tony winning regional theater. Um, Comparable to RG, I mean, RG is a lot smaller than the Alliance Theater, but it's that's what it is for Atlanta is the Alliance Theater. Um, but they have a huge theater community in Atlanta and, and worked there a lot. And then uh, just started to bounce around regionally a little bit and then wound up back here. Um, and then when I got back here, I was lucky. Within two weeks, I met Jack um, I, uh, for Hal Dupas from, uh, from Blackfriars and got Little Women, got a part in Little Women. He had actually had someone drop out. Um, and I had auditioned for him. And uh, he, he called and just said, I had someone drop out. I don't know you. And... I know I saw you at the auditions. Would be interested in coming to read for this role, and I was like, "Sure." And I read, and after that, it was we became really good friends really fast, and worked a lot with him. And then that was my connection into Blackfriars. Was literally this two weeks after I moved back here in two thousand six, the fall of two thousand six. Yeah, yeah, I just, I just, I remember, I remember you coming in, and and everybody was like, "Who is this guy?" I'm like, he just fell out of nowhere. <laughs> and and you became a mainstay. You became a mainstay in Rochester, and you know everything that you you've brought to it. And you know Jack uh, retires, and they're looking for a new artistic director. And there you are. And it was, that was that was serendipitous too, because it was um, the, I was uh, artistic director at the Rochester Children's Theater, and I was there for five years. And I just stepped into that position about a year and a half um, before I joined Blackfriars as as the artistic director. Um, and they were they were uh, they were um, restructuring how their organization was going to work, and the performance and the public performance end that I was in charge of uh, because we were at Nazareth College. Um, we were we were stepping away from Nazareth College, and so that part of the company was uh, was going away. And then uh, Debbie Haber, who was the um, co-founder and artistic director, um, was uh, restructuring the company and taking another the other part of it to do her new musical work and educational work. And so I was essentially out of a job at the end of that season. And it just happened that out of, out of nowhere at that time, Jack had announced his retirement. Um, and I was actually thinking I, I, I'd been at about, about a month and a half, two months when I was sitting there before I knew what I was going to do. Um, and I was thinking, okay, well, I guess this means I start to bounce around again. Maybe I, maybe I leave, maybe I go somewhere else. Maybe I, I have friends in Chicago, I have friends in New York still. Um, I was like, maybe I, maybe I just go somewhere else for right now. We'll see what happens. Cause there wasn't anything here that I could, uh, connect to. And then he announced his retirement. I was like, Oh, well, I can submit for this. And then if that happens, then great. If it doesn't, then, then I make, then I make choices. So yeah, it was kind of serendipitous. It was, it was, it was again, lucky. It was just lucky. And you're in your third, third season now. So yeah. This is uh, my third season. Third now. season as artistic director. And from, you know, that, 1300 page it novel landing on your desk um sort of came around you were involved with dracula writing mm -hmm. a performance piece here um and that was about five years ago six years ago 
when it was first the first one was 2009 2009 okay so yeah almost 10 years ago (laughs) yeah i saw an article in the i saw that i was was, uh, going through files and i saw it and i was like 2009 oh my god i would have said the same thing if someone asked me it was like yeah probably about five years ago it was like 2009 yeah um so you brought your back your horror roots you 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 got to, (laughs) to write something and then you brought it back to the blackfriars theater um, this past season, and it was really cool to to see that. But it's also cool, just you know, there you are. You, you know, you read that book. You started telling your own stories, whether it be through comic books or you got that chance to step onto stage or you pulled out that video video camera and started making your own movies. Yeah. Um, what what has it meant to tell stories throughout your life? I, I think it's. It's a it's a way to it's a way to connect with people. I think I mean we tell stories all day long, every day. It's all we do. You, you you something happens to you and you call someone up or the next person you see, you're like, oh, okay, guess what happened to me at the post office today? I went in there and you know, and we 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 it's instinctual with us. It's 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 part of our human nature is to tell story. And it's always been, you know, it's always been part of <clears throat> historically um that that uh uh, passing down of, of history, passing down of the generations, passing down of tradition, you know, that, that's how we operate. And, and it's, it's innate in us to, to want to feel that catharsis, to want to feel that heroism, to want to feel that pathos, to want to feel that empathy, to want to feel that sadness, to want to dream, to want to yearn, to want to overcome. Um, it's, it's, it's in us, it's human nature. Um, and to me, that sharing of that uh, is what is what that performance art element is. Being able to share that in a group and experience that together uh, is something really special. It's something really uh, meaningful. I think I think it, it 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 connects us as a as a as a group of people in a way that nothing else can. I mean, with, with sports, we get that we get that catharsis. We get that when you win, you know, or when you're trying to overcome something. We we still get those feelings. Um, but we're kind of on the outside in a way as you, as you're watching something happen you have the love for the teams you have the, the that connection with the players but it's kind of from the outside but when you're when you're watching a story unfold you can almost fall into it you almost you become part of it and you find yourself in it you know you're talking about the the kids from it you know you, you find yourself in it you find where you are as a person in those moments and connect to it and it challenges you and it pushes you and it it, it, it elicits these emotions from you that, um, that are that are just there waiting to be waiting to be activated. Um, and I'm just rambling, but no, you're good. But I think, but I think, it, to me, it's it's something that connects us all as human beings, and I think it's experiences that we all yearn for, um, to be moved, to be touched, to be to be allowed to feel. Um, through these through these other stories uh, is really important. It's really powerful. I think it's really important. And I also think it's yeah, you know if I get in my soapbox for two seconds. I think it's it 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 teaches us. It's an education tool. Theater, movies, books, TV. I mean, telling stories teaches us how to be empathetic. Teaches us how to understand. Teaches us how to appreciate. Teaches us how to be kind teaches us how to deal with conflict. Um, it's an educational tool by experience um, that I think, I really think is one of the, if not the most powerful educational tools for us to to connect with one another, especially in a time like we are now where we're so divided. Mm-hmm. But being able to to tell tell stories that that help us understand. And, and I'm not talking about agree. I just mean understand, to, to understand empathy, to understand listening, um, uh, to understand h- how to uh, uh, accept or um, take in what's happening uh, and, and have a dialogue about it. Um, to connect really is that, is what theater does. It helps us connect. And I, I think there is a, a big thing happening right now where a lot of people, a lot of things just bouncing off of people. They're not letting it absorb. They're not connecting. They're not letting yeah. it soak into them. So take a trip with me. One last thing here. Mm-hmm. Time travel machine in a different dimension. Okay. A kid that vaguely looks familiar, looks like a younger you, 13-year-old, sitting on a couch, just finishes a, 
a novel, puts it down on the ground. You happen to walk up to him and he says, hey, mister, what advice would you give me about this book? <laughs> about, about the stories that I want to tell. What would you say to him? I, I would say just be honest, be truthful, trust yourself. I think, I think, you know, as artists, I, I went through it and we all go through it. I think that you, you, you question your choices. You, you, you aren't always sure that you can, the voice that you have is going to be heard or is going to be what people want to hear. Um, or is going to be the right one. I was trying to find out what the right thing to do or right thing to say or the right story to tell is or the right way to react or the right way to connect. And I think um, I, would, I would say you know, just, just you know, tell the stories, but trust yourself. Be honest. Be genuine. That's the most important thing. Thank you, Danny. Thank you. And with that, um, I would like to say thank you for Danny for coming on the show. Um, and by the time you've heard this, he's also been on the show as a guest on the main show. So if you haven't heard it, Go back, listen to that one. Danny, if somebody wanted to stalk you or find you, where could they find you on social media? <laughs> oh, man, I'm terrible at social media. I am on Facebook. <laughs> I am on Facebook. I'm, I'm rarely on it on my own, but uh, but I'm, I'm on Facebook. Occasionally, he uh, he's on the Blackfriars Theater page uh, putting out some <laughs> funny little videos with his uh, cohort, Mary, over at the theater. Um, you can find me. Uh, as GF Media or at GF Media CEO pretty much everywhere. You can find us at culturalstew.net or at culturalstew.net on Twitter or culturalstew on Facebook. Catch you next time. liked what you've heard, please consider sponsoring us on Patreon. Patreon is a creator support system that allows people to support the things they love and creators to continue doing what they love. Head on over to patreon.com slash gfmedia and choose the Cultural Stew podcast levels to show your support for us. Thank you. Thank you.